Saxon Advanced Mathematics, <clears throat> lesson 39. We got a two-parter today, you guys. And the first part, I'm just gonna be honest, it's gonna blow your mind a little bit. Um, the topic is called radians, and I'm going to begin with the end by telling you that you're gonna get used to this idea and it's gonna become very comfortable. And if you go on in mathematics, it's gonna become your new normal. You're gonna love this idea. For right now, your brain is probably gonna resist a little bit, but that's okay. Just be patient with yourself and it will fall into place. Radians are another way to measure angles. Okay, it's a unit of measure. We have, up until now, talked about measuring angles in terms of degrees, right? When we measure an angle, we've said that, we know that this measure matches this measure, and we've called this, oh, what should we call it? Let's call it like 30 degrees. And this is 30 degrees. And we know that in a half circle, a semicircle, there are 180 degrees. And we know that in a full circle, there are 360 degrees, right? That is easy, that is comfortable, that is familiar. Now we're gonna learn this new unit. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of the theoretical explanation of it right now because I don't wanna confuse you. Philosophy, I like to save philosophy for after you understand the basic calculations. So we're just gonna do the practical stuff now. If you measure from here to here, that is a distance of the radius, right? From the center to the edges, the radius. If we take that same measure, and I'm just eyeballing it, and we put it here, this is also one radius measurement, right? From there to there. If we draw an angle and make that length of the radius, to be the length of the arc, we can call this one radian. And we substitute it rad, one rad, except we say radian. All right. So that is tying the unit of measurement to the length of the radius. Oh, it's an interesting idea. And what we'll find is that in a half circle, well, how many times does the radius go around here? 3.14 times, which equals pi. So in a half circle, we say that we have pi radians. What? That's crazy, right? And so then in a full circle, we have two pi radians. So what we just created was a little chart wobbly lines. This is the, the degree measurement and this is the same measurement in radians. Okay, super practical. We're going to specifically focus on this one because this is the single unit of pi and we're gonna use these unit multipliers. Pi radians is the same as 180 degrees, which we will substitute as DEG rather than the little circle because we'll cancel sometimes. Or we can do it the other way, right? Just like any good unit multiplier, 180 degrees is the same as pi radians. These two little tidbits are the tools that are gonna save us in these problems. Um, and we're going to practice working some of the kinds of problems that we've been doing already, just having the, the degrees measured in radians instead of degrees. So let me just show you what that looks like. And I'll show you how to quickly translate the problems back into something familiar. Example 39.1. 
four times the sine of, here it comes, ready? When you see that, you go, oh, that's rads. That's radians. Ah, okay, we'll fix it, don't worry. Plus the sine of minus pi over three. So instead of having cute little degree measurements that we're used to, we now have some strange looking characters in our problems. But here's what we do. The very first step is to convert the radians two degrees. Eventually, we're gonna start working our problems in radians when we feel a little more comfortable, but we're gonna baby step into that, and our first step is just to see them, recognize that they are, these are radian measurements, and quickly convert back. The way that we can do that easily is just substitute 180 degrees in wherever you see a pi measurement. That's how we can quickly do the substitute. That is the short form of using it as a unit multiplier. So this will become four times the sine of 180 over four plus the sine of minus 180 over three. Okay, now that looks pretty, that looks much more reasonable, doesn't it? Now let's simplify. 180 divided by four, well, let's see, 180 divided by two would be 90. And then 90 over two would be 45. So 180 divided by four would be 45 degrees. I'm gonna use our symbol there. Plus the sign of, let's see, minus 60 degrees. Oh, oh, now we have, we recognize a friend, right? So much better. And again, like I said, we're gonna get used to seeing these. Eventually they will feel like friends too, but for right now, we just convert them immediately, get the problem into a familiar, friendly shape and carry on just like always, okay? So now we can go on with the problem. We'll draw our pictures, 45 degrees, that's the first quadrant. There it is. It's our friendly triangle. One, one square root of two. Sine is Oscar had. So it is four times sine one over square root of two, right? And then we can rationalize like this. And so we will have Sorry, I was just looking ahead. Uh, this will be four times the square root of two over two, which comes all the way down to two times the square. Well, let's leave it like this because we don't know what shape that will take. Um, okay, so there's our, our rationalized version of this expression. Now let's work on this part. Minus 60 degrees, that's gonna be fourth quadrant, right? Now let's see, what's the sine of sine going to be in that quadrant? Let's get our chart up here. Plus, 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 minus, plus, minus. You're gonna need to have this memorized for the test. You're gonna need to have the quadrantal values chart memorized for the chest, test. So start working on your memorization. Um, sine in the fourth quadrant is negative. Uh, so this is gonna look like this, that's 60 degrees, that's the 30, right? This is the 60, so this was the original side, so that's the two, and this is the one, and this must be the square root of three, right? We have to get our triangle oriented. Um, so this is gonna be minus, because sine is minus in this quadrant. This minus just helped us find the angle. This minus relates to the fact that sine is negative in the fourth quadrant. Um, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. I'm gonna write that down again. The opposite is square root of three 
the hypotenuse is two. And so we can't do anything more to fix this. Look, we have matching denominators, so we can say four square root of two minus square root of three all over two. That is our final answer, yes. All right, so I hope your takeaway is that once we get this converted, which is a pretty easy process, we just plug 180 in for pi and then simplify based on the fractions we were given, then it's all the same. So rads won't hurt you, they're fine. Okay, let's do a couple more to make sure we have the hang of it. Example 39.2, and I'm gonna write right up here, pi, equals 180 degrees. Evaluate the sine of, oh, look at this, 13 pi over four. Ay, 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 what the heck is that? Um, plus three times the cosine Okay, do not panic, do not worry. Everything will be fine. We'll just plug these, uh, we'll just plug 180 in for pi. Now, we already learned back here a couple tidbits that are gonna help us. 180 divided by four is 45. That's gonna help us simplify and get push through these numbers really quickly. 180 divided by three is gonna be 60, and 180 divided by six is 30. Notice that these are the denominators that give us our friendly triangles, right? These, you don't really have to memorize these, but what I'm pointing out is that we're gonna see some of these same patterns of numbers form again and again and again. And so we can make our calculations a whole lot quicker if we keep in mind that some of these uh, fractions are really easy to reduce. Okay, so this is gonna be the sign of, okay, I'm substituting in the 180 for the four mentally, right? I'll write it out. It's a little fast to start with the mental gymnastics. 180, and this is all over four, right? It looks exactly like that. This I know is gonna cancel and give me 45 degrees. I pointed it out right there. Now all I have to do is multiply 13 times 45. And this becomes the sine of 585 degrees. Now, I also know when I see that number that that's more than one spin around, isn't it? And to just continue my notes down here, here's the full circle. When I go around, it's positive, so I know I go around one time. That takes care of 360. What happens when I take 585 and subtract 360? What am I left with? 225, so that takes me through 80, or 90 rather, 180, and then I have another 45. Ah, so that's gonna be, this is gonna simplify to a 45 degree angle in the third quadrant. See how I got that? First I simplified for the 585, just managing the numbers. Right, I substitute 180 in. I see that 180 over four is gonna give me 45. I multiply 13 times 45, and I find out that that's a 585 degree angle. And I think, where the heck is that gonna be? That's more than one time around. So I start thinking here about, okay, how do I measure that? There's 360, then there's another 90, another 180, I figured out though it's 225. So once I started the second loop around, I went 90, 180, now I need 45 more. So that's a 45, 45, 90 angle in the third quadrant. That's a lot of thinking, you guys. That's like five different lessons all rolled into one just to get us to this point. 
Stop and appreciate how smart you are. Stop and appreciate how much we have learned building on what we knew in the past, but also pushing our knowledge forward in this year so far. Okay, we're almost done with this. Sign is Oscar had. I always write that down, you guys, because it's so easy to make dumb little mistakes and grab, you know, the adjacent instead of the opposite or something like that. Um, let's put our numbers on. One, one, square root of two. So the sine of 585 is one over square root of two. And to rationalize it, we know we multiply it by square root of two over square root of two. So it's now square root of two on the top over two. Okay, no coefficient on this one. Looking way all the way up here. So this is our best answer for this side of the equation. Now let's go here. This one we're gonna have to remember we have a coefficient of three. Okay, the first thing we'll do is adjust to get the radians out. Remember, eventually we'll be comfortable finding the degree just based on this, but we're not there yet. We just adjust back to degrees. Um, one, we, so we're substituting in the 180. Cosine of minus five times 180 over three. Excuse me. <coughs> oh. Excuse me. Okay. This reduces to 60. I mean, we can see it, but it just, it's helpful to get those, did those, uh, these simplifications really clear in your mind. This goes away. This becomes 60 degrees. Yay, we're in degrees now. This becomes three times the cosine of minus 300 degrees. Okay, we don't have to do such a fancy calculation as here because we're within one spin. Minus 300 is going to be 90, 180, 270. It's going to be in the first quadrant, isn't it? And it's going to be, I'll do that again, 90, 180, 270. Then we need 30 more. So this is going to be our 60 degree angle. And this is going to be our 30 degree. This is our long side. This is our short side. And this is our Uh, calculated side. Cosine is a hold, right? Oscar had a hold. And let's see, we need to put a value on this. I didn't do that. There's so many steps, right? Okay, so sine in the third quarter is negative. So this needs to be a negative value, right? And then over here we have cosine in the first quadrant. That's positive. Okay. So our value is going to be positive. And I do like to put the plus sign there. It reminds me that I've checked it. Like over here, I forgot to check it. So I didn't have anything. It's a good idea. It's a good practice to put plus when you determine that it is positive so that you don't forget that step. Um, okay. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse is one. Second, I'm just follow. I'm trying to follow along in my book. Yeah, it's one over two. Okay, but we have to multiply it by three. So that makes our final value plus three over two. So our final answer is just to connect this. It's going to be minus the square root of 2 plus 3 all over 2. Beautiful. Okay, so the, the takeaway that we have once again on this problem is once you convert our radians into degrees, which is a pretty straightforward calculation, it's all the same. Another one of these, and then we're gonna do two word problems that apply this concept. Cosine of minus 25 
radians over six minus two times the tangent. Okay. First step, get rid of your radians. This, remember we, let's just do this, let's not rewrite it. Let's just mentally change that out to 180, okay? 180 over six is 30. 30 times 25, this is gonna be the cosine of negative 750, isn't it? Put parentheses around it to protect that, and this now is degrees. Oh, all right, and let's do this one. The 80 over three cancels down to 60. Four times 60 is 240, so this is gonna be minus the two times the tangent of 240 degrees, okay? Now it's a problem that is familiar and we're good to go. All right, this is gonna spin us around, right? It's minus, so we're going in the opposite direction. So there's 360. Now how much do we have after we go one spin around? I take 750, I subtract 360, that's the first spin. And I can see, oh yeah, this is gonna be, I can do a whole second spin, can't I? Just a second, I, no, I, I'm spinning the right way. We can go around a whole second time. And then I'll have 30 left. So this is gonna be a 30 degree angle in the fourth quadrant. Okay, it always takes a little bit of thinking to work that through and be patient with yourself. So this is a 30 degree angle in the fourth quadrant there's the 60. I always like to just orient my um, triangle really carefully. This is the two side, this is the one side, the one that got chopped, and this is the square root of three. Um, let's make our chart of our trig values in the different functions, or the trig signs in the different quadrants is what I'm trying to say. Minus, plus, minus, and then this is the easy side. Okay, cosine in the fourth quadrant is positive, and cosine is a hold. So it's gonna be positive adjacent square root of three over hypotenuse two. Beautiful, it's rationalized. I'm gonna leave it alone and go on from here. All right. Two times the tangent of 240. Okay, this is less than 360, so we know we don't have to worry about spinning around. It's 240 positive degrees, so that's gonna be 90, 180. It's gonna be third quadrant, isn't it? Ninety, one eighty, two seventy 270 would be the whole thing. I only need 60. So here's 60 degrees. That makes this 30 degrees. That means this is the two. And this is the one. And oh, I, <laughs> I was turning my head to orient the triangle the way I'm used to it, right, with 60 on the top. And I made my one in the wrong direction. One. And this is the square root of three here. Okay, we're here. We need tangent this time. This is over Arthur, right? Okay, and tangent in the third quarter is positive, right? That's tangent. These are in order, right? Sine, cosine, tangent. Uh, okay, so it's gonna be positive. So I'm going to be and this is gonna be a positive value, but I have a minus sign in my equation. So that will be negative, but this value will be positive. I hope that makes sense. The minus sign just comes from the uh, expression we were given. It's not an equation. It's an expression. 
but that we were given the minus sign. The minus isn't the value of tangent. Okay, and so over Arthur, opposite is square root of three. Adjacent is one. Okay. And so there's our fraction. It's rationalized, but we need to make common denominators so we can combine it, right? So we'll multiply this by two over two, and then for our final answer, we'll get, uh, I'll write it out again. Square root of three minus two times the square root of three. All of this is over two. And then we can simplify that one more time because we can actually subtract those, can't we? So it will be minus square root of three over two for our final answer. Oh, I see what I forgot to do. We have to multiply this by two as well. So this is, I forgot this. I forgot the coefficient. So back here, this should be two times the square root of three. This two is this two. Does that make sense? That's our answer. Two times square root of three over one. And I still need to rationalize the denominator, or not rationalize, but make least common multiples. So this then becomes four. And then it's one square root of three minus four square root of three. So that's minus three square root of three over four. That's a really common and easy mistake to make you guys. I did all that calculation just fine, but I forgot to multiply by my coefficient. And honestly, I hate to make mistakes, but I'm really glad I made that mistake because it illustrates to you how important it is when you get your value to check back and make sure you picked up any coefficient. And I got lulled into complacency because we didn't have a coefficient on this one, but we did on this one and I missed it. So don't be like me, kids. Remember your coefficients. Okay, so there is our third example. Now we're ready to move into the word problems. And there's one more tidbit. You know how, I don't know if you're aware of this, but he does it sometimes in other ways. John doesn't always teach us everything we need to know at the beginning of the lesson. Sometimes he'll bury a really important piece of information in one of the examples. And in the same way, he'll do it sometimes, won't he, where he, um, he ups your game and, and you have to know new information in order to do a certain homework problem. So he can be tricky like that, but I'm glad that he is because that's the way it is in, in upper level mathematics in the university. Sometimes you have to teach yourself. So I'm going to give you a little piece of information that John buried in this example. And it's kind of wordy, but I'll show you what I mean. The length of the arc of a sector is equal to the central angle measured in radians times the length of the radius. So we've got a circle. Let me just draw a picture that illustrates this. We've got a circle. We've got a central angle. We've got an arc. Okay, this is the arc of the sector. In order to find the length of this, we take that measurement and we multiply it by 
the radius, which is that measurement, okay? Don't write this down in your book yet. Let's, let's take a minute and see what it means before we, let's do the problem before, there's actually two problems that work on this, um, before we write it down because I want you to, I want it to make a little bit more sense before you do it. All right, now John gives us a very complicated and confusing problem, but all we're gonna do is apply that idea. This is example 39.4. Can you imagine all of this is just the first topic of this lesson? Ooh. All right, John gives us a confusing story, but let me help you make sense of it. The latitude of a point on Earth is the degree measure of the shortest arc from that point to the equator. Okay, that sounds confusing. Let's just keep going. The latitude of Los Angeles, LA, is 34.5 degrees north of the equator. Okay, so what we've got is we've got the Earth. Here's the equator, right? Here is LA up here, and then we're shown that that's the central angle, right? That creates a central angle, and we're told that's 34.05 degrees. How far is it from Los Angeles to the equator Oh, that's the arc of the sector, isn't it? That's the arc of the sector if the diameter of the Earth is that big number. Okay, so there's John's picture. I'm going to draw a slightly simpler picture. Here is... I don't want to draw it three-dimensional because that just creates more confusion. So I'm going to draw it just as a two-dimensional circle, and you have to remember that it's not. There's the center of the Earth. We saw in the picture that this is the equator, and this is LA up here. We're trying to find this measurement. What we're told is that this central angle is 34.05 degrees, and we're told that the diameter of the Earth, so this whole thing, equals 79.20. Okay, this sounds vaguely like what I just described to you, right? We're trying to find this. So let me just flip back and say, oh, okay, so what you do when you want to find the arc of that sector is you take the central angle in radians and multiply it by the radius, okay? So we need the central angle in radians, and we need to multiply that by the length of the radius. We don't have either of those pieces of information, but we can get them, can't we? We know that to adjust this, we can use our unit multiplier. We know that pi equals 180 degrees. And if we have pi in an expression, we can just substitute really quickly this in for it. But this will be a little bit trickier. We'll need to take... 34.05, hi Grace, and we'll need to multiply it, hi, hi, by, Grace wants to be petted, by pi reds, radians, over 180 degrees. So basically what that does is it ends up We end up dividing that and we get 0 0.594 radians. Okay, you can do that calculation and have that come out. Pi is the unit that we want to keep. Okay, um, I wish I had two calculators. I'm going to have to work on that because I wish I could show you this calculation. Um, but this is what you should get. And like I said, my phone is busy doing its thing. I should get my iPad. 
Um, I'll do that in the future so that I can show you that. Okay, so now we have the central angle converted from degrees to radians. That's great. Now we need the length of the radius. And all we have is the diameter. Well, all we have to do is take 7920 and divide it in two. And we will get... Thirty-nine sixty. Okay. Now we have the two pieces of information that we need, and so we take zero point five four, zero point five nine four radians, and we multiply it by thirty-nine sixty miles, and our final answer is two three five two. Point two four. That represents, that's how many miles it is. That's the length of this sector. Okay, so that's the measurement from the equator to LA. Just over 2,000 miles. That's the right answer. Okay, hopefully you can figure out these calculations. These are the correct answers. So that should fall into place. This one's pretty easy. Okay. Kind of makes sense. Let's try one more application that uses this same calculation. So I'm gonna write that down first so we don't forget it. The central angle measured in radians times the length of the radius equals the length of the arc. Of the sector created by the central angle. Okay, here's another one. Theo measured the angle between the base of the building and the top of the building and received a reading of 0 0.6 degrees. Okay, so here's a building. And he stood over here and he measured from there to there. Oh my gosh, let's make the building just a little bit taller. Um, <laughs> I'm really happy with how that turned out. And this measure is 0 0.6 degrees. If Theo was 4,000 feet from the base of the building when the measurement was made, How high was the building? Okay, now we look at this and go, this isn't exactly a circle problem because this isn't curved, right? This is a straight line. But here's the thing, because our angle is so tiny, the length of this sector is gonna be really close to a straight line. Okay, the length of the cord, this is technically a cord, right? Because it straightens off that rounded edge. Technically, the, the sector would be like this, right? It would be rounded. But because our angle's so tiny, the rounded and the straight lines are almost the same thing. So John is allowing us to make that simplification. Huh, interesting. So all we have to do is adjust this and say that, I'll do it so it comes down like this, 0 0.6 degrees times pi radians over 180 degrees will give us 0 0.010472 radians. Wow, that's a number. Pretend I'm doing that on my calculator. That is definitely the right answer, 010472. And then we multiply that. So this is the central angle. And then the, the length of the radius. I'm coming down, right? I don't wanna write it over there. I wanna write it closer. The radius, this time it's just been given to us. It's 4,000. 
And so then our final answer is 41.89 feet. That's the length of the arc. And in this case, we're saying, yeah, it's the same as the length of the sector because this is such a tiny little thing, right? I drew this way disproportionate just so we could see what we're doing. So this is your final answer. Those, you guys, are very advanced and sophisticated problems. I hope they didn't blow your mind wide open. Radians are our friends, even though they feel like invaders at this point, but we will become much more comfortable with them as we go on, and you will learn to love them, kind of. Um, you'll learn to think in them. It's kind of like a foreign language, where at first it seems so awkward and stilted, but later you're like, oh, I can go back and forth. It's no big deal. All right, linear equations. We have a short bit to do with these, and this is part B. Now, here's the thing. We're super familiar with linear equations. We know that they take this shape, right? We know that X and Y are gonna stay variables, but we can plug in lots of different values for M and for B, and we can draw the lines that are super easy to graph. This is called the slope intercept form of a line. But guess what? We can rearrange this into different shapes and we can give it different names. So here are some other examples of that. Oh, this is different, isn't it? We put the X and the Y and the number all on the same side, and we call that the general form. Okay, so I'm, oh, my chart is already gone wonky. I'm gonna start over, you guys, because I want it to be neat. Ready? B. I don't think of myself as a perfectionist, but sometimes things just have to be better. Okay, y equals mx plus b, that's our old friend. That is called slope intercept. And that's a really good name for it because we see the slope and we see the y-intercept. Then we can do this, let's shove all the different, everything over to the left the x term, the y term, and the plane c term, and let's set the other side equal to zero. We call that the general form of a linear equation. Then there is this form, which is confusing at first. x over a plus y over b equals one. And again, it's just algebra. It's just shoveling the numbers around that allows us to create these, dif create these different forms. This is called the double intercept this now look what we're doing we're getting into subscripts and we're going to see how all of these work don't worry this is called the point slope. Oh, I don't like how I made that word stick out so far. Um, make yours prettier. And then the last one is called the two-point form, and it looks like this. Okay, so this is general information to save so that when John uses these expressions, we know what the equations look like. And we're gonna do a little bit of fooling around with some of these different forms and see what they're good for. But what we're gonna practice first is just translating. John will give us the form in, the, he'll give us the equation in one form and ask us to switch it to another. So let's try that. 
I'm gonna flip so I have more room to write. And there are three of these problems. Here comes the first one. Y equals, oh, that's minus 7 thirds X plus 1 fifth. And he wants us to write this in general form with integers as the constants. Okay, so he means no fractions. So this is slope intercept and we're supposed to go to general. And remember the general form is the one where everything's shoved to the left and the right side is set to zero. Okay, well, you know, the first thing I'm gonna wanna do is get rid of those <clears throat> denominators. You know I have a vengeance for them. Least common multiple of three and five has gotta be 15. Least common multiple is that name. So we're gonna multiply everybody by 15. It's an equation, so that's the right strategy. This will cancel to a five. This will cancel to a three. So now I have 15x equals minus 35, oh, this is a y, sorry. 15y thir minus 35x plus three times one is three. Okay, and I just slide everything over to the left. When I change sides, I change the sign. So that gives me 35x plus 15y minus three equals zero. That looks like this. And we're done, that's correct. Oh, that's not so bad, is it? John starts us off nice. Example 39.7. Use the point slope form to find the equation of the line whose slope is minus one over three and passes through the point minus two, five. Then, trans so first we're supposed to find point slope, and then we're supposed to transform it into general. Okay, well general's right there, so we've got that one. Let's try to remember what is point slope. Well, you don't remember it. I barely remember it. It's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Okay, now these little notations are confusing. The plane x and y mean that they're going to stay in the equation just the way they are. The y1 and x1 mean that's the point we're gonna take. So this is our x1 and this is our y1. So we're not looking to replace the first, the y and the x. Those will stay. These are the ones we'll replace. So that becomes a lot easier, doesn't it? Because we're just gonna plug in these three values to this. So it will become y minus five equals minus one third times x, and then it's minus, minus two, so it becomes plus two. Oh, okay, so, so taking this information and filling it into the point slope form was easy. We just substituted it in. The hardest part was recognizing that the minus minus two would become a positive. All right, now we want to transform it into this. So what should we do? Let's, let's multiply by three to get rid of our denominator. Okay, so that, now we're starting the transformation process, right? So this is our answer for one. Now we'll multiply by this whole thing by three and this whole thing by three. So that will become three y minus 15 equals, now this minus sign, this cancels this, we still have the minus sign, so that's gonna flip our signs on this. So it's gonna become minus x minus two. That was kind of tricky. All right, 
And now we just have to swim these guys over to the right. So it's gonna become plus x, and then we'll add two to this, right? Plus x plus two, there, I'll write it all out. This cancels, this cancels, and we're gonna get x plus three y minus 13 equals zero. And that is the correct answer. Compared to that whole crazy central angle measure, measured in radians times the length of the radius equals the length of the sector. Compared to that whole crazy thing, this is pretty easy, isn't it? One more. This is a long lesson. Write 2x minus 3y plus 4 equals zero. Oh, that's general, isn't it? We're supposed to write that in double intercept. Okay, the double intercept form is, let's get that in front of us, it looks like this, x over a, plus y over b equals one. Okay, so let's start by moving this to the other side. So that will be two x minus three y equals minus four, right? Now, We need to turn this into a one, right? So let's divide everything by minus four. Okay, and this will become, okay, x over two, that's pretty easy, those cancel. Now this one is weird, let's go over here and make sure this looks good first, right? This is going to be, I'm gonna just work on this term down here because we're gonna write our final answer there. That, these two negatives become a positive, so it's three-fourths y, right? Now, how do we change this so instead of it being a multiplication coefficient, it's a division? Well, multiplying by three-fourths is the same thing as dividing by four thirds. What? If that blows your mind, start with this and think about how would we fix this, right? Well, it's a complex fraction. We would multiply it by 3 over 4 and 3 over 4. That would eliminate that. Look, we got ourselves right back to where we were. So this can be written as y over 4 thirds, which is what we want, right? It seems crazy but this is the final answer, okay? So when we're multiplying by a fraction, use your knowledge of complex fractions um, to work backwards and figure out how to move that fraction to the denominator, all right? And you just take the reciprocal of that. That's the shortcut, but use your complex fractions knowledge if you're getting stuck. All right, and here it says, uh, that's not important. We're not gonna worry about that. All right, so that's our final answer. That's part B in which we're playing around to um, change between the different forms here, there, all these different forms. This chart in a different shape is on page 282. If you want to mark it in your book with a little post-it flag or something. All right, we're exhausted. We did it. Lesson 39 is history. Thank you. Goodbye.